Wow, what a wonderful day it is here in Japan, Emperor Maiji. Yeah, wonderful day. Wait, who's that? Hello, my name is Perry, and I'd like to trade with you. No, thank you. I don't think you understand. Oh, okay. I think I'm you... glad that you made the right decision. Okay, he's gone. You know we need to do something here. How about we just go over Europe and copy everything they've done so far? That sounds like a good idea. Let's do it now. So off went Japan to try to get caught up to everyone else's standards. At this same time, Russia was under the rule of Tsar Nicholas II and Sergei Witt, both of whom saw industrial growth as crucial. Later, Russia's territorial expansion to the south and east, especially in Korea, led to confrontations with Japan. Hey, look at here. Russia's trying to take Korea. Oh yeah, let's get them. During this war, Japan surprised Russia at Port Arthur, where Japan took a major victory until the Pete's Peace of Portsmouth, which was mediated by Theodore Roosevelt of the USA. This treaty made Russia recognize Korea as a sphere of influence for Japan and had to sign over its 25-year lease on Port Arthur, including the peninsula and naval base. Ow, I hate those Japanese soldiers. Hey man, worry about our own problems back at home. Hey Russia, I'm with you. Yeah. Oh my god, me too. Yay, let's all be best buds. I'll call it the triple and pod. So, can you watch the palace while I'm going on vacation for a while? Sure, I can do that. Okay, see ya. At this time in Russia, things weren't going the best for the people. The Jews were being persecuted against with things like the pogroms, which are massacres of the Jewish people. Also, most Russian peasants and serfs were not happy and wanted to make demands to Tsar Nicholas II, which they attempted to do on January 2nd, 1905 under the radical priest Grigorgi Apolonovich Gapin at Tsar Nicholas's Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. We want to talk to Tsar Nicholas. Uh, you can't talk to him right now. Uh, we have a petition for him. We're not happy. Uh, you really can't talk to him. Uh, bam, 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 bam. And with that, many of the peasants fell to the ground dead in what is known as Bloody Sunday, which really set the tone for Russia in the coming year. What soon followed was a wave of mass political and social unrest also known as the Revolution of 1905. That was ridiculous. The Tsar thinks he can get away with anything. We should kill him. Excuse me? Uh-oh. You are hereby exiled to Germany. I'll take it. Dang it. Russia is such a mess and I have no idea what to do. I got it. I'll create a Duma which will work towards reform. Yeah, that'll fix everything. So Tsar Nicholas II instituted the Duma which made citizens calm down. However, Actually, Nicholas just stabbed the backs and determined to keep his autocratic power, ignored the Duma, and went on with his life, which soon led to the March Revolution of 1917. During this time, Tsarina Alexandria and Tsar Nicholas II had a son named Alexei. Yay! Dang, this kid bleeds a lot. He must be a hemophiliac. Call him Miss Putin. He knows what to do. Have I been summoned? Yes. Please help my son. He's bleeding nonstop, but we need your help. There, all better. Go kill Rasputin. He tried to make his way into our family. Okay. Hey, Rasputin, come here! Tsar Nicholas II had ignored the Duma for too long. It was time for the Russian serfs to revolt. They did so in the March Revolution of 1917. Peace and bread. Peace and bread. Down with autocracy. Down with autocracy. Dear Nicholas, there is much distress here. There is a hooligan movement. Troops, we need to go defend the country from the revolting peasants. We got it. So off went the troops to disperse the crowds, but in the end, most of the troops joined the revolt. With no way to keep control, Tsar Nicholas II abdicated on March 15. Now that the Tsarist regime had fallen, the revolt turned to the provisional government, which was mostly middle-class citizens. However, there was another problem brewing in the Soviets, who were councils of workers and soldiers' deputies. They represented the more radical interests of the lower class. Russia also had a Marxist Social Democratic Party, which split into the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were the main party, now who had come under the rule of Vladimir Lenin, now that he had returned. Under Lenin, they became a party dedicated to violent revolution. 
Hey, Lenin, we are getting crushed by your country. If we send you back, will you take over and stop attacking us? Sure, it sounds great, but how am I going to get there? Uh, we have a train. Awesome. With Lenin now back in Russia, it was time for a Russian revolution. Now that I am in charge, I hereby issue my April Theses, which say that the Soviets of soldiers, workers, and peasants are ready instruments of power. During this time, the provisional government was having a hard time handling everyone. Alexander Kerensky, a socialist revolutionary, became prime minister of the provisional government, but he was forced to release all the Bolsheviks since he was being marched on in Petrograd. Lenin saw this as a great opportunity to act. Hey Trotsky, thanks for helping me overthrow the provisional government. No problem. Hey, let's form a military revolutionary committee within the Petrograd Soviet to plot to overthrow the government. Great idea. And it was just that easy. The Bolsheviks seized the Winter Palace with little bloodshed in what is known as the November Revolution of 1917. Now Russia was led by a council of people's commissars, which was headed by Lenin, who instituted his new economic policy, which would bring capital to Russia and allow all of the people to own their own small businesses. With many new reforms taking place and Lenin in charge, Lenin promised peace, which he soon realized would not be possible with all the losses of the Russian territory. So on March 3rd, 1918, the new communist government signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with Germany. With this new tra treaty, we will lose eastern Poland, Ukraine, Finland, and the Baltic provinces, but this doesn't matter since the whole world will be, will be communist soon. The Russian Civil War was basically everyone against the Bolsheviks or Reds. The main opponents of the Reds were the Whites or anti-Bolsheviks. We want communism! We want capitalism! No, we want socialism! Yeah, we won! Thank you, Trotsky, for making us well-disciplined and really good fighters. Trotsky was the best general for the Reds. At one point, he even reinstated the draft. However, it wasn't just Trotsky's great fighting style that led the Reds to victory. All of the Whites soon realized that they were fighting for different objectives. We had agreed to fight for one cause only. We want to restore the regime. No, we want to reinstate liberalism. With all the fighting, the Reds ended up coming out victorious and instituting their war communism, which included the nationalization of banks and most industries, along with the centralization of state administration under Bolshevik control. The Reds also used the revolutionary terror, which included the use of the Cheka, or Red Secret Police. Do you believe in the white cause? Don't tell anyone, but yes I do. Haha, <laughs> now you must die. Now that the Bolsheviks had completely taken control of Russia, it was time to spread communism to the rest of the world. Was that it?